The department says food costs have gone up 4% this year, and a recent UN report says we'll see more of the same over the next decade as demand increases and farm output slows. Joining us now to talk about how his company is dealing with food price inflation, Whole Foods CEO John Mackey. Mr. Mackey, welcome to Bottom Line. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Mark. The food inflation problem, that's not just a U.S. problem, that's a global problem. How do companies like Whole Foods address that? It's a... It's a, it's a global problem because we're, de, we're debauching our currency in America right now. So we're, in a sense, exporting currency with artificially low interest rates and money expansion. Uh, all we can do is adapt to it. We can't control it, so we just have to adapt to it. We pass on costs where it's necessary, and where we can, we try to hold the line. But uh, it's a problem that all of our competitors have as well. How tough is it to try to hold the line when you know that shareholders are watching? Uh, you have to balance your stakeholders. You've got to do things that are good for your customers and good things, things that are good for your shareholders as well. You talk about something called conscious capitalism. What is that? Well, conscious capitalism is capitalism, but uh, with the idea that companies have the potential to have a higher purpose and you manage the business on behalf of all the stakeholders. But how do you balance that? Because at one point, you want to maximize profits, but you also want to be socially responsible. Are the two mutually exclusive? I don't think they are. I think that you can create win-win-win-win strategies where all of your stakeholders are simultaneously winning. They don't have to be in conflict. There don't, there don't have to be trade-offs. That's kind of the myth. But is that a myth that has gained some form of speed given this economic climate that we find ourselves in? I think it's natural for people to think in terms of trade-offs. If somebody's winning, someone else be, must be losing. But the miracle of capitalism is you can create scenarios where people are simultaneously winning. Mr. Mackey, I mentioned in the open about that UN report, and it did say that over the next decade, demand is going to increase and farm output slows. How do corporations like Whole Foods help to feed a growing global population? Uh, it's a good question, but so far, humanity's innovations technologically in agriculture have been able to increase food productivity faster than we've increased population. Historically, food prices have dropped. That's been the long-term trend. I think it probably will continue to be the long-term trend. Mr. Mackey, before the interview started, I was mentioning that I'm, I'm familiar with a Whole Foods store in New Jersey. Uh, one of the things that people say it's a it's a criticism and I know that you're aware of it is that everyone can afford to shop at Whole Foods primarily you say that your products are natural that they're organic but that does cost more than it would at a typical supermarket how do you balance that out with I know your desire stated desire is to see Americans eat more healthy food well Mark it depends upon what you buy if you shop intelligently and you buy mostly whole grains, beans, fresh fruits and vegetables that are in season, it's not that expensive. In fact, we've done a study that shows you could eat uh, a complete plant-based uh, whole foods diet and not spend more than about $5 a day per person. So it doesn't have to be expensive. That's largely a myth. So are you saying that the shoppers at least need to be a little bit more educated in what they choose? Well, you need to know how to cook. And yes, you need to be able to purchase foods in the raw forms and then cook it. If you do that and you eat primarily whole foods instead of processed foods, uh, it doesn't have to be that expensive. What role does agribusiness have in making food more affordable for the population as a whole? Well, agribusiness depends on how we define what that means. Uh, that's oftentimes used sort of pejoratively, but if you think of it as the entire agricultural sector, We've actually had major gains in productivity in agriculture over the last 100 years. Food, Americans, for example, spend less than 10% of our income on food right now. 100 years ago, we spent closer to 40 to 50%. So that's farm productivity. Is, is that simply the reason why the change? Yes. We're a lot more productive in agriculture than we were 100 years ago. Organic. I, I realize this is a pedestrian question, but please bear with me. I, when I knew I was going to interview, I said, I've got to ask him, define organic for me and for our audience. Well, organic has a specific legal definition. Yes, it but does. I'm not going to give that because it's complex. It's got pages and pages. But in essence, it primarily means foods that are raised without synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. Um, 
and, and grown in close to their natural state. So it's mostly no synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. But some of the foods, even some at Whole Foods, some of them do have, they might have MSG in it, they might have preservatives in it to keep the food for a longer period of time, no? Actually, not at Whole Foods. We don't permit any preservatives or MSG in our food. The organic landscape at one point used to be primarily the domain of Whole Foods, but now we see Walmart in the picture as well. Has that competition been good for you? It's been certainly been good for the world, good for, uh, good for but consumers. But has it been good for you? Well, it, it, it has. Our sales are very strong. I mean, I think Walmart spreads the awareness, and people that, that really get interested in organic foods tend to trade on to Whole Foods. Has it changed your marketing strategy at all? Uh, I can't say that it has, no. In what sense? Because aren't some of the same foods being sold in both stores? You asked me if it's changed our marketing strategy, and the answer, it hasn't. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Low interest loans to local farmers. Yes. Is that still something that Whole Foods is doing? It is. We are, particularly we're trying to promote local agriculture, uh, and we're making, we've made a number of loans. I think we've made about $4 million in loans to small local farmers around the United States and Canada. How has that changed local communities? And secondarily, how has that changed eating habits? The local loan program? Yeah. Well, I think the local movement is something that I think is very healthy. That's been a, a rebirth of, of small farms and agriculture in communities. And I think that's a very good thing. And Whole Foods is focused on that. And a lot of our competitors are copying us. We see the whole farmer's market uh, explosion. There are farmer markets, thousands of farmer's markets in the United States that weren't there uh, 10 years ago. So I see this as a very healthy trend. Do those local farmers markets have, for lack of a better term, an in with Whole Foods? Are their products being sold there? Or are they welcome there? Some of them, some of them do, and we we cultivate those type of relationships. Some are more gardeners, and they mostly want to sell just in the farmers markets. But if they begin to upscale or increase their production, then they may want to trade uh, up to Whole Foods. I should point out that this week, business leaders from around the country, including yourself, you helped to form what's called the Job Creators Alliance. What is that? The Job Creators Alliance is a consortium of CEOs and companies that recognize that it's going to be private business that creates jobs, not the government. So we want to band together and try to raise people's consciousness of the importance. If we're going to decrease unemployment, it's going to have to be entrepreneurs and business that does that. We're looking for government to do that, and that's not going to happen. We just need to set the conditions up that encourage uh, entrepreneurs and businesses to be able to, to hire and grow. Mr. Mackey, what might those conditions be, at least a couple of them? Well, uh, in some cases, regulations have gone too far, and it really makes it difficult, particularly for a small business. There's too much bureaucracy and red tape. Uh, taxes on business are very high. So we're not creating the, the enabling conditions that allow businesses to get started. It's a lot, it was a lot easier for me to start my business 30 years ago than it is for an entrepreneur starting out today to do the same Why? thing. Why? Is that because of the regulatory yes. hurdles, increased regulatory hurdles? Correct. Yes. I have to ask you about something. A lot of people say when Whole Foods comes in that sometimes it inadvertently creates a wealth disparity that there's a certain segment of society that can afford Whole Foods and a certain segment of society that cannot. How do you counter that criticism? How do you address it? I don't think it's true. As I've already pointed out, Americans now only spend less than 10% of their income on food. We, we, tend, we make our choices based on what we value. And if you value healthy food, then you certainly can afford to shop at Whole Foods. But, but in these tough economic times for a lot of Americans, aren't they also making their choices based on what income they have and what they can afford? Again, if you want to eat the healthiest diet in the world that you possibly could eat, you don't need to spend more than about 5 to $6 a day per person. But it would require you to, to have some consciousness about what you're purchasing. You'd need to learn how to cook. And, but you can eat. The healthiest foods in the world are not the most expensive foods. It's all these processed junk foods that people eat that don't have any nutrition in them that uh, are, are, are tend to be more expensive. Mr. Mackey, uh, in our final minute, I just want to ask you about something. Uh, when Whole Foods goes into communities, some people embrace it. And as you mentioned in, in a New Yorker article I read not too long ago, that some people, some people do not. There's a local incident going on now in Boston where you're going to be taking over a place. I believe the uh, area is called Jamaica Plain Neighborhood. But some people say they don't want the culture and, if you will, the flavor of the neighborhood to go away. 
say it's a predominantly Hispanic community. How do you address concerns like that and let people know in local areas where there's going to be a Whole Foods that we are going to hold on to the community and hold on to your needs? Well, it's a difficult situation, but sure. you have to understand in the United States, uh, we're a country that's also based on freedom and liberty, and things do change and they do evolve. We're going into that market because we believe a substantial part of the community wants us to be there. Okay. Maybe not everyone, but those that don't want us to be there, they shouldn't shop with us. And there's other alternatives. We're not the only food store in town. So what about the people that want us to be there? Shouldn't they have a choice to shop with us if that's what they prefer? Uh, America's about different alternatives and letting people freely choose what they think is best for them and not preventing other people from getting what they choose. John Mackey of Whole Foods joining us on set. Sir, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks, to meet you, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me on.